Today I read to you from the Gospel according to St. Mark, uh, from chapter 7, selected verses. You'll see those listed in your bulletin. You can follow along on the screen as well. I'm reading from the Common English Bible today. The Pharisees and some legal experts from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating food with unclean hands. They were eating without first ritually purifying their hands through washing. The Pharisees and the Jews don't eat without first washing their hands carefully. This is a way of observing the rules handed down by the elders. Upon returning from the marketplace, they don't eat without first immersing themselves. They observe many other rules that have been handed down, such as the washing of cups, jugs, pans, and sleeping mats. So the Pharisees and legal experts ask Jesus, why are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders, but instead eat food with ritually unclean hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah really knew what he was talking about when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He wrote, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is empty since they teach instructions that are human words. You ignore God's commandments while holding on to rules created by humans and handed down to you. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said, listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing outside a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. It's from the inside, from the human heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual th sins, thefts, murders, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, insults, arrogance, and foolishness. All these things come from the inside and contaminate a person in God's sight. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. It was early on in my uh, pastoring that uh, I decided to try intinction, communion by intinction, where you take a piece of bread and dip it into a cup with a congregation that had only had this particular method of communion once or twice in their, their time together. And I remember doing this, this with them and, and the very next day receiving a phone call from someone who was very irate, saying, Preacher, I don't like the way we did communion yesterday. It's messy. People's fingers get in that juice sometimes, and there's crumbs floating around all over the place. It's not like we have to share everything with everybody, is it? And, and I just kind of explained to them, you know, that this was one way of doing communion. And I talked a little bit about the symbol, symbolism of a common cup and, and sharing in that, and they were still irate when we got off the phone. Well, a little while later, I received another phone call. Actually, this person actually came by to see me. It wasn't a phone call. They said, uh, Preacher, I wanted you to know that I really, really enjoyed the way we did communion. I said, really? How so? And they said, well, it's nice to have that symbolism of, of, 
of us all sharing together from, from a single cup. It's nice to know that we're all coming together around that. And they said, besides, I've always thought it was really strange, you know, that we take a little shot glass of Jesus. <laughs> well, I kind of decided on that day that in order to keep everyone equally unhappy, okay, that I was just going to do communion any way I could find to do it. Because that way, not everybody is upset at one time, at least. And, and some will be happy. It's interesting, the things that we find to disagree over in the faith. Very interesting at times. Uh, there are big battles and, and little battles. Big battles, like those taking place in, in our denomination and other denominations, for that matter, right now. And, and little ones, like those things over, well, you know, what room in the church building on what particular days should be used by what particular groups. Those little things that come up. It's interesting to me, because whether it's a, a little battle or a big battle, there is an equal amount of passion given by those who are involved in these debates, discussions, disagreements, whatever you wish to call them. And in this little discussion we read about today in Mark's Gospel, those of us who live in the 21st century have very little or no reference point for the debate that's taking place between Jesus and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. However, what the Pharisees were discussing was extremely important. You know, we, we think that, you know, they were bringing up some minor point about ritual cleanness, but that's not it at all. What they had been given down or what, they had, what had been handed down to them was the idea that the people of Israel were to be different from every other people in the world. They were to be holy. And one of the ways they marked their holiness was that the priest would never eat anything from, from the altar, offered on the altar without being ritually clean. And so the priest would be different, and then the people could be different by also observe, observing ritual cleanness before they ate anything. So by this mark, people would know, oh, those are those Jewish people. Those are those ones that say they're chosen by God. This was something that made them holy, set them apart from all other peoples. So this was as much a debate about identity as God's people as it was about hygiene. In fact, it was more about identity than it was about hygiene. And Jesus doesn't brush it off as some little thing. Instead, Jesus gives a good, passionate, theological argument for what his disciples are doing and should continue to do as he makes his main point. You see, what was important to Jesus was that a disciple's heart, or whatever place in your body, your spirit, you wish to think about this. You consider the place that directs your actions. That our hearts are supposed to be in line with God's will for our lives, for our community of faith, and with every other relationship we have in this world. To Jesus, it's not, it's not about religious observance. It's about people being morally centered on the fact that God so loved the world that he gave the gift of his son in return for us, living out eternal life now and even after we die. 
There was a preacher who launched into a, a passionate and fiery sermon on the dangers of different kinds of sin, things that separate us from God, show our unholiness to ourselves and, and others. Oh, the preacher launched into talking about sexual sin and how adultery was tearing apart marriages throughout the land. And the preacher really went at this for a while. And, and there in the, in the back of the church, you know, after a few minutes of talking about sexual sin, there in the back of the church in the amen corner, there were a couple people sitting there, and they went, amen, preacher, amen. And so the preacher moved on and, and, and began to talk about yet another sin. The, the preacher talked about uh, violence, about violence in society, and, and how it could be that words could just as easily be violent in the way that they're used and just as dangerous and destructive as anything else we, we wish to try and regulate in our world. And those words are used to hurt or ridicule. And those same two people, there in the back, they were going, Amen! Amen! And then the preacher started talking about racism. About how the division between uh, races of people was nothing more than the sin of thinking that we, or our particular culture, is somehow better than than others God created in the world. Same two people there in the back of the church started nodding a little bit, but were quiet. And then the preacher started preaching against, you know, against people refusing to tithe to their local church. Well, some because they just didn't think it was all that important. And others because they had some grievance with, with the church that despite the fact that it was a place that they had made their vows to before God, they just weren't going to support it for the time being. The preacher said something like, they were simply robbing God and, and showing how little faith they have in God to work through the very church that has fed them. At this point, the two people in the back didn't move a single muscle. Finally, the preacher launched in discussing the, the sin of the sinful practice of gossip and how talking about others to someone else, even, even sharing a thought about one person without you know, going to that person and sharing it with them directly, about how that was a destruction of relationships that went against everything God and the Trinity taught us about relationships. At that point, one of the two people in the back, same two people, was heard to say, you know, the preacher started off pretty, pretty strong this morning, but she done gone from preaching to meddling now. Folks, I could, I could stand here all day long and rail against all the things you know you should not do. I could do that. If you need a list, there's a partial list in this passage we read from Mark. It's not exhaustive, mind you. It's, it's a good start, as they like to say. But you know, Jesus didn't give us this list so that we would know what not to do. That's not why he brings this up in his discussion with the Pharisees. That completely misses the point altogether. He's saying, Jesus is saying, that when our center, our heart, is not perfectly aligned with God, then no amount of hand washing or anything else we do or do not do will protect us from being separated from God. We will end up doing things like this that he lists here because our hearts are not taken over by the love 
God has for us. It's not that we do them and break away from that love. These things are symptoms, not causes. Symptoms of things we're holding on to that keep us away from God. Paul reminds us that sin is a very part of who we are as human beings. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the remedy is to not just stop sinning. You know, stop trying to stop sinning is just another way of, of washing your hands. Jesus gave us this list so that we could recognize that when we do things like this, there's something we're holding on to that is not about us being focused on God. We hold on and hold on instead of letting go and allowing God's love to fill us to a point that nothing else can come out of us but that love. Lists of symptoms are there for you to know when you're not completely and fully expressing the grace God has given to you. My brothers and sisters, as we come to this meal today, come as those who are thankful. Come not because it's just a ritual, but because it's a reminder of what is the... what is at the very center of your being. God loves you so much that he gave his son. He gave his son for you. Anything less, yeah, that's sin. And God gave us his son so that we can do better than that. Amen?